This is Mongolian Mindset, and we're going to be responding to another subscriber's uh, request. Um, Gurav Jengid content. What about Patrick Bay David and Todd Valentine? Um, so uh, I'm going to do PPD because I like PPD. Um, Patrick Bay David. So uh, you guys know how this goes. Um, Personality Database has Patrick Bay David as a ENTJ. Um, you guys know we use Linda Barron's metrics, temperament, and interaction styles combined with some um, cognitive functions, and we will figure out someone's personality type. Um, so, yeah, um, the chart here um, says it all. You know, uh, Patrick Bay David, they have him as an ENTJ, so that's systematic outcome, um, initiating, pragmatic, direct, and abstract, okay? So uh, that's what ENTJs are. That's what personality database has them as. So we're going to use temper interaction styles and then cognitive functions to figure out uh, wait, what's his real personality type. And yeah, and um, if you want to be typed by us, um, all you have to do is join our Facebook group and message uh, my moderator Cody with uh, your availability, and we will get you typed. Um, well, primarily, we do it on Fridays. Saturdays and some rare occasion for Sundays um, But yeah, but let's get into this 50% of our viewers are not subscribed. You guys can please subscribe um, It's um, quite helpful. It helps us grow the group um, it helps us grow this channel and uh, if, if things keep going well, you know um, We'll be giving back in the group. So, um, so Reach out support and let's get into this Questions on what you want to do next? The world is going to put you in the box on what you have to do next because they're determining who you need to be. And you are rising up to their expectations because you're not asking the questions yourself. So clarity to me is stemmed from you being able to sit down and ask those tough questions that piss you off, that irritate you, that make you emotional, that you cry over, that you reflect. That oh, oh, that is outcome, 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 outcome. Jesus Christ. Okay makes you want to do research that makes you follow up it makes you want to do research that's te makes you sit down and say i don't really know i've never thought about this before and that goes deeper and deeper and deeper everybody indirectly will impose their belief system into you mm -hmm. and it's never going to stop you know this whole thing about people say oh my gosh i can't wait to win to shut up all my haters talking about what people say Reality check. It ain't never happening. Okay? It ain't never happening. Because every time you come up, it's just more of them. Right? And they're always... The great thing about haters is haters highlight your weaknesses. In the States, taking himself from massively in debt to a personal net worth of roughly $150 million dollars. Pretty extraordinary for somebody who fled Iran at the age of 10, spent two years in a refugee camp in Germany, got fired from Burger King, and left the military in his 20s with no money and few monetizable skills. He summed up his secret to success in his video, The Life of an Entrepreneur in 90 Seconds, which went viral, ultimately gaining well over 30 million views and helping to blow up his personal brand. Now, he's also the founder of the YouTube juggernaut, Valuetainment, which has nearly 1.2 million subscribers and a ton of valuable content if you're looking to succeed at the highest levels. As a part of his mission to spread the power of entrepreneurship, he's interviewed some of the world's most extraordinary people, including NBA Hall of Famer Magic Johnson, billionaire Mark Cuban, and Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak, making their wisdom accessible to anyone willing to learn. So please... Help me in welcoming the man who wrote The 25 Laws to Doing the Impossible, the ferocious Patrick Bet David. Oh, man. How are you? Good, dude. Welcome. Good. Thanks for having me. Absolutely my pleasure. I'm super excited to have you here. It's great to be here. And I want to start maybe somewhere a little unusual, but I want to talk about bodybuilding. Let's do it. What, what was it that drew you to that? <clears throat> and maybe more importantly, what did you learn from what I'll call one of the most intense disciplines in the world? So when I was uh, 14 years old, I was 6'1", uh, 135, and my name oh. wasn't Tyro Banks. So that, that's, that's, that's what I got into bodybuilding. And uh, there was a commercial, maybe you'll remember this, there was a commercial that said, uh, 
you know, I used to be skinny, you know, uh, rejected by girls, and now I drink milk. And, you know, I, I, I don't know if you remember that commercial, the milk commercial. Yeah, yeah. So for me, I said, man, I need some muscles because I, I need a date, I need girls, I need to go out, I need to protect. Outcome, I need muscle, I need a date, I need girls, outcome. Myself, and I started hitting the weights at 14 years old. I would go to the gym uh, with three sweaters on, and there was a guy in there named uh, Fred uh, who took a liking into me. He was like five years older than me, and uh, I was benching the bar. You know, the bar is 45 oh, yeah. pounds. And when you don't have a lot of strength, when you, you know, bench the bar, <laughs> the bar is shaking, right? So he pulled me and says, come here, kid. Don't look at anybody. You're going to have a two and a half pound rule on what you're going to do. Every week, we're going to increase your bench by two and a half pounds. Mm -hmm. And that's all you need to do. And then from there, that whole two and a half pound idea, I applied in business and everywhere else and at work. Systematic. You apply a system, formula. Okay. Two and a half pounds every week, systematic. Because uh, that led me to, you know, I was in the army. I had in my room was all, you know, posters of Arnold, of Ronnie Coleman, of Aaron Baker, of Chris Cormier, of Lee Haney, all of these guys. And that's how I'm gonna run for them. T name dropping like crazy. Wanna go be a Mr. Olympia one day? What did Arnold represent to you? Uh, Arnold represented to me. Uh, the story of an immigrant with a fire to prove a point uh, that he wanted to control the narrative. You know, when I say controlling the narrative to me is he's... Uh okay, so Patrick Davis coming off direct, man. He's, he's direct. Uh, specific, concise, to the point. Little, Very little words used. Uh, so uh, with that saying, him being direct, um, that eliminates eight other types. Uh, because he's direct, that means he can only be uh, the in charge types, um, the ENTJs, the ESTPs, the ESTJs, and the ENFJ, or he could be a uh, chart that course or finisher, then that's going to be your ISTP, INFJ, INTJ, and ISTJ. Okay, so we know that already. Because this guy's direct, he's specific, concise, and to the point. His voice is kind of forceful. So. Uh, uh, written the story for his life. You know, Winston Churchill said, said many years ago, history will be kind okay, to... Okay, he's referenced uh, outside source Winston Churchill, that's the... Me for I intend to write it. Mm -hmm. I think Arnold wrote his history. This is what I'm going to be doing. You know, I'm going to come here, I'm going to compete, I'm going to win, I'm going to go into Hollywood, I have an accent. Outcome, 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 outcome. With or without it, I'm still going to go into Hollywood. I'm gonna marry a Kennedy. I'm gonna go. Look at these outcomes. I'm gonna marry a Kennedy. I'm gonna do this outcome, outcome, outcome. And I'm gonna do what I want to do in my life. I'm gonna do what I want to do in my life. That's on the uh, pragmatic state. I don't know. Maybe he's talking about Arnold. He was an example he's of this is possible. So, so the that. thing that I find interesting about bodybuilding. But when he's, he's talking about Arnold, he's not going in depth with Arnold. He was just talking about the outcomes, the end products. I'm gonna marry a Kennedy. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do this. That that that. Outcomes. Started lifting in my mid twenties ish, and for me it was very different. I grew up in a morbidly obese family, so I was somewhat trying to escape that. But quite frankly, I wanted to look like Hugh Jackman, so that was my obsession. Um, that was right at the heyday of the X Men franchise. He was I can Wolverine. see Hugh Jackman. Like oh man, I was I was just about it. Okay, so he just initiated. I can see Hugh Jackman in you. Um, so you put initiating. And. I really did hate it. I hated every minute of being in the gym, but there was something to that, the this discipline, the two and a half pound rule, you know, of every time that I cycle through a body part, I've got to be a little bit stronger, a little bit stronger, a little bit stronger. And my partners and I used to talk a lot about what's super weird is here we are where these three entrepreneurs were using discipline in- All right, so compare and contrast Patrick Bay David with Tom Ballou, okay? I don't know if I said his name right, but- uh... One is progression, the other one's outcome. One is progression, the other one's outcome. I think, I'm not 100% sure, I probably need to type this guy, but I think he's probably... Mm, looking at his content, mm, probably NTJ, INTJ. Lifting in the exact same way that we would use it in business, the ability to push through something hard, the demand that you grow and get better, and we were looking at other people, and Arnold became fascinating so to us. We were looking at other people from Tom, look at that, that's SE. He was the only one that could apply it to every area of his life. Mm. Like, what made him great in bodybuilding, and I think my favorite 
Schwarzenegger quote is somebody said to him, I don't want to look like you. And he he's says, quoting with Arnold, that's T E. Don't worry, you won't. So I knew I was going and to like spot the, on the truth and the sort of wonderful arrogance of that quote, of how hard it is that it's never gonna happen by accident. But it's always fascinated me how few bodybuilders are able to translate that discipline. How are you able to take that and apply it to business and other things? I got to tell you, I'm surprised you're asking this question because no one asked this question, but everything that I've done post bodybuilding goes back to bodybuilding. It's amazing when I tell you. Applying a system to everything, okay? Bodybuilding, learn that system. It's kind of like the same thing that I've done. Okay, get your ass in the gym. Tell you everything. Uh, in bodybuilding, you'll learn areas you miss out on, which is what? Most people don't do legs. You know, Arnold at the beginning stages of his career. Talking about what other people don't do. Let's see, come on. Curious, he would take pictures in the water because, you know, he didn't want to show his calves. So he would always do thighs because he had the thighs, but he didn't have the calves. So I'm doing a pose with the, uh, uh, in minimizing the calves. Then he started doing the donkey raises with Franco Colombo on his back and he really got focused about the calves. And he had these massive calves in business. It could be the same thing. You could be all good on front end, you know, marketing, but your operation sucks. And for me, I was so front end, I was so sales that I wasn't good in operations. Mm -hmm. And I didn't pay attention to the systems. I didn't pay attention to, we don't need technology. We don't need to look at automation. We don't look at this. We need more marketing. We need to do this. And finally, the conversation got deeper and deeper and deeper to the point where we have to pay attention to them. My wife pulled me in and she brought the board in. She brought everybody and everybody sat there and says, we need to invest in technology. And uh, when we did that, I could scale because now you have a knob. And whenever you have a knob to control and you, you increase it a little bit, when well, flow. Talking about control, that'd be out in the realm of outcome. So we know this guy is direct and he's outcome. Okay, so being direct and outcome, that means he's either ESTJ, um, ESTP, and ENTJ, and ENFJ, okay? Because he's direct and outcome, he has initiated once. I think he initiated immediately when he walked in as well. Um, but uh, with that being said, he has to be one of those types. And it's clear as day this guy's TFI. We've already got a couple points for that. Um, so ENF, ESTP and ENFJ are going to be eliminated. We're going to be down to two types, ESTJ and ENTJ. Was coming in. That's what really helped us grow the business to a different level. So, yeah, when I look at bodybuilding and what that did to my life business-wise, everything went back to small little growth, right, beating your prior best, and then shocking your business because that's like a new campaign, new initiative. So same thing with business. So I would say a lot of it applied from that into business for me. I loved the um, the life of an entrepreneur in 90 seconds. It's basically that. It's how to build yourself brick by brick. You're talking about how you see the flash, you see the cars, the money, the house, but you don't see the times where they were freaking out, stressed, anxiety, things were going wrong, and they had to just get better every day. And by doing that day after day after day, they were able to really turn themselves into a beast. And one of my favorite stories about what you're talking about with Arnold and his calves is, so he goes through the phase where at first he's standing in the water and he doesn't let himself be photographed, and then he flips it, and he makes a sweatsuit where the only- You see how he goes through the progression? It goes through the progression. Look at the two. That's an INTJ, and that's probably an ENTJ, okay? The part that's visible are his calves, so that he could never distract right. himself with something that looked good. <clears throat> and he would walk around the gym with his worst body part exposed so that he'd make sure that he'd put in the work. And I found that, like, incredibly interesting. What do you think about this notion of made, not born? Like, how much of it do you think people like Arnold has terrible calves, but he can really build them? How malleable are we? Um, made not born. So for me, I have three kids. Okay, now we just had a great conversation with my kids, but I have three kids myself. So I look at my kids from the day they're born, they are who they are. So we t parents tend to take a lot of credit for their kids. Like, hey, you know, look at my kids. So my that's a wonderful thing. Um, that brings in a perfect topic. Uh, you pick up Linda Barron's book or Dario Nardi book, uh, like they say, um, they believe we come into this world with a personality type. And there's just the second half. So. Find out your personality type. It will help you a lot. I said, well, you know, I know how to raise him and I know how to do this. And in a way, it's fine because it's pride because that's my kid. That's my blood. That's my this. But I don't. That's my blood. That's my kid. That's a FI. To know if parents can take as much credit or as much blame for the kids. And I know some people may disagree with this and say, wait a minute, what are you saying here? I'm not saying there isn't. But it isn't 80%. I think it's 20%. I think the other 80% is when you're born, 
there are some elements to you of mm -hmm. how you are. My oldest is very quiet. Every picture you see him taking, he's looking at you like he's looking through your soul, like he's <laughs> trying to figure out what you're thinking. This kid has been like this since day one. The middle one, charmer. Everybody loves this kid. Everybody's like fascinated by this kid because he's so friendly. He'll run around here. He talked to Ricky over there from Boston and he'll go around making friends with everybody. That's Dylan. That's how Dylan is. And the small one's got a temper, but she's going to get what she wants and she's very <laughs> assertive, right? Okay. So I can sit here and say, yeah, that's, you know, that's me because of my parenting stuff. So I think one is the way we're born. That's our DNA. That's one. Two is things that happens in your life. For instance, for me, uh, if I watch a whistle, if I see a movie scene with a whistling sound, I'm going straight back to Iran. Mm -hmm. Instant. Right? But if you hear a whistle, too, you're going back to a park. I'm not going to a park. I'm going to Iran. I'm going to Iran, going over a bridge, and a bomb drops 50 yards behind us, and my dad says, don't look back. I'm in a white Renault. My sister's sitting next to me. My mom is over here. My dad's over. We're going to a city called Karaj, which is the Palm Springs to L.A. We're trying to get away from the war, and I look behind me. The bridge is coming down. I mean, that stays with me till the day I die because that whistling sound. That's not parents. That's life experiences that causes that. A heartbreak, a breakup, parents getting a divorce, a fight, getting bullied, being knocked out publicly in front of your peers. Discuss peer outcomes. Humiliated. A girl breaks up with you in front of your peers, outcomes, leaves outcomes. you for your friend. End product. All end of product. these things. Like, then, literally, these are all end products, okay? End products, end products, end products make you because of those experiences now when that happens uh it's like a formula you are gonna do one of three things formula systematic so you're, you know the whole flight freeze or fight you're either gonna freeze and you're gonna suppress and keep it internally and eventually you're gonna implode and when you implode you're gonna hurt a lot of people or you're going to flight and you'll avoid that person every time you're running around them oh my gosh she's here i'm gonna go in this room i'm gonna avoid her i'm gonna avoid her i'm gonna avoid her or you're gonna fight right now, you know what freeze happens, nothing happens. Flight, nothing's happened. But fight, that part is born during those moments. And, uh, you know, so you figure that part of what the person's made up of. You can't teach that part to somebody. You can't say, somebody could encourage you and somebody could say, hey, Patrick, stand up for yourself. Yeah, but you could say that to me when people are around, but what if no one's around? Most of the time, no one is around. You have to learn to stand up for yourself. So when you ask the question, born versus that, made. That's more of a pragmatic approach right there, okay? It's a more of a pragmatic approach, okay? Yes. Uh, learn to fight, learn to be on your own, learn to be able to stand up for yourself. It's more of a pragmatic approach. I, I don't think it's a one-dimensional answer. I think it's such a multi-dimensional answer that if we get deeper to it, you'll be able to figure people out and say, no wonder this guy became who he is today. Because these three different things combined. Wow, that's I would say that's abstract. So I don't know if that answers your question for you or not, but for me, that's kind of It starts to, but, but I really want to <clears throat> push. So I'm talking to a guy that does valuetainment who is creating content, which is definitely telling you how to live. You wrote a book, The Laws of Doing the Impossible. Um, your video that popped off and went viral was all about how you can learn, and it, it I'm going to use my words now. It doesn't matter who you are today. It matters yeah. who you want to become and the price you're willing to pay to get there. Um, so help me and, and maybe there's just another part of this help me square the your sort of the totality of your dna and your experiences and then you completely end up shifting your life you said the best thing that ever happened to you was hitting rock bottom because it forced you to reevaluate your thinking so what i want to know is right now there are people watching us and they are panicking that you're saying that who they are today is just it's a product of you know their the culmination of their DNA and their experience, and it's a trap, basically, and they are who they are. But I don't think you believe that. I don't think that's what I'm saying, though. So how, yes. what is that next level of malleability? How much can we change? So what I'm saying is a part of it is your DNA. We have to understand that. There's a part of it that is your DNA, but... And you'll never be able to break free from that, or you just have to understand it so that you know how to change? No, for example, you know, if, you know, if you are somebody that, um, the personality, I can't change your personality to be like X, Y, Z. You know, this whole concept of our modeling, you know, you got to so model. Like for instance, if you're an ESFP, um, they can't change your personality and make you an ENTJ, okay? It's just not gonna happen, okay? Somebody. Too much modeling leads to imitation because you're not being you, right? So speaking, some people say, well, Pat, I don't see a lot of people speak like you. You speak differently. I don't know any other way to speak, but I used to try to speak like a somebody else that I was trying to model. And I said, no, no, this is how I speak. 
This is me. This is my method of delivering my message to you. Make this sense. Is my Great. method. Let's be systematic again. Great. If it doesn't make sense, it doesn't make sense. But make the part about sense. the other side for me is I also believe firmly that events, conversations, certain individuals can completely say something that can change your life forever. So what are some of the tools that you use? I know that you've talked about clarity is super important. Carrots, talk to us about those two things, which I think are both pretty powerful. Yeah, Tom, I, I would say questions. You know, like right now, uh, uh, I, 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 I'm more curious about people that I can't even help myself. I'm asking you questions like, hey, you know, uh, how come you- Yeah, because I'm initiating, I'm extroverted. I'm asking you questions. You're supposed to be interviewing me and I'm asking you questions. You don't have any kids. We don't have any kids. Why don't you have any kids? Well, because, you know, we decided six years ago we're not gonna have any kids. Well, how- He cares about what Tom thinks. Did, how did you know T- that? Well, he got married 17 years ago. We've been together for 20 years. And my wife, so was a decision, an emotional decision or a logical decision. I think it was a logical decision because it was finding a way to get in, you know, fulfillment. What you and your wife did is what very few people do. And the whole purpose is sitting down. What other people are doing again? That's SE and I. And asking the questions. What if I get asked a question that I don't have the answer? What if I don't get a what if? That's abstract. Maybe you hear that phrase. One of the scariest things about life is a question. The 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 scary question can shake a soul up, because no one's asked that question from you. So for me, the transition for somebody to want to change it and get clarity is actually asking questions. If you don't ask the questions of what you want to do next, the world is going to put you in the box on what you have to do next because they're determining who you need to be. And you are right. Pragmatic approach there as well. Rising up to their expectations because you're not asking the questions yourself. So clarity to me is stemmed from you being able to sit down and ask those tough questions that piss you off, that irritate you, that make you emotional that you cry over, See, these that you reflect. All fucking end products, all end products, outcome. That makes you want to do research, that makes you follow up, that makes you sit down and say, I don't really know. I've never thought about this before. And that goes deeper and deeper and deeper. So clarity. I guess he's using his TI. T is stamped based on like the way you answered the question to me, Tom, it was amazing. So do you have any- Just kids? initiate. The way you answered the question to me. No, we made a decision a long time ago. We didn't want to have kids. The way you said it was like, very nonchalant. <laughs> really, it was so like, yeah, that's what we did. Then I said, so tell me how you processed it. It's very obvious that was a very comfortable, certain decision with a lot of time put into it. Very few people do that. And then you got clarity and clarity gives confidence. So somebody looks at your eyes, when you give the answer, there is no, you know, looking away or uncomfortable or anything. You're like, this is who we are. This is the decision we made. But that clarity came from all the conversations you and your wife had together. I don't think enough people do that together. Yeah, he's like he's like old power in this damn conversation that this guy's initiating like crazy. One thing in your book that you talked about that I thought was really interesting was you asked the question, to your point about questions, when was the last time you thought about your identity? And you just brought that up. What's that process for people? How do you be like how what is the identity, which I think most people give stats? Like what do you mean by that and how can people begin to shape their identity? So, uh, uh, Tom, who were you in high school? What was my identity? Okay, so you just initiated again. Tom, who were you in high school? Yeah, so if I was in high school with you, who were you? You were a comedian? thousand percent. Okay, comedian. When did it change? Uh, As soon as I went to college. He is directing this shit and initiating. He is overpowering Tom. Tom, I wonder if that's how Thomas didn't feel. Shelly Thomas. I decided I wanted to become the artist, which was not necessarily the right decision, but that was, yeah, when I changed. And then what happened from artist to quest? See Poverty. That? He is running the show now. Got it. And so he is I, literally took control of the show. I, so I start, um, want to be the funny guy because I need attention in high school. Okay. I, by the end of high school, I'm very good at making people laugh in a sort of living room funny way. Mm-hmm. I do countless hours of practice of stand-up comedy. And when I go to college, I'm like, my only style of humor is self-deprecating. So I'm always making fun of myself, which actually makes me think a little bit less of myself. So I very much had an inferiority complex in high school. I cheated my way to being in the top 10 of my graduating class. I did terribly on my SATs. And I come into film school and I'm like, this is what he's doing. He's talking about all this stuff. One, two, one, one, two, one, one, two, one. Did this, 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 that. I want to do with the rest of my life. Like I actually want to be good at this. And that's one sort of realization I'm 
grateful for was I realized at some point you're in the big bad world and you're either good or you're not. Mm -hmm. And so you better stop cheating, really pay attention and get good. And so I thought I need to take myself more seriously, stop making fun of myself. So I didn't tell anybody that I was, you know, a, a comedic person or anything. I didn't make jokes, nothing. And so I began to adopt the identity of the artist. You see how he's going through it. You saw that. You see the difference between Patrick David and this guy. Okay, one is progression, the other one's outcome. I have some artistic failures, which creates this identity crisis. Boom. It's like I'm it's, very much. It's in like it's flowing like a journey, man. When they're talking, it's like flowing like a journey. Like when, when outcome people talk, it's like a stop, 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 stop of poverty now because I've graduated. My parents aren't helping me anymore. I'm selling insurance door to door. Uh, so what year is this? What year this is, is this would have been 99. Wow. This guy's initiating like crazy, man. He's taking over the interview. So 20 years ago. Yeah. So, and, and I'm just like in this, I'm sliding towards depression. I have no sense of how I can make things come true. This is all pre-internet. So like, there's just, there's no hope for me. Mm -hmm. Like there's, mm -hmm. I, the idea to make a hundred thousand dollar film, which back then there was no YouTube, there was no video cameras you could make movies on. I mean, it just wasn't a thing. So it was like a hundred thousand dollar film might as well have been a hundred million dollar film. So I'm stuck. What am I going to do? And that's when I meet these two entrepreneurs who are like, look, you're coming to the world with your hand out. And if you want to control the art, you have to control the resources. And so that began a very long journey of identity for me. Talking about the journey, the progression of figuring out who am I? How do I define myself now? And how is that useful? Wow. Like understanding that it is completely malleable. I can decide right now that I'm somebody else, that my identity is something new and something different. Like I remember the day I told people I was gonna start lifting. And I just said, right now, today I'm lifting and I told people I'm gonna put on muscle, I'm gonna look like Hugh Jackman. Everybody's like, yeah, yeah, right. And I just went beast mode and I just started working out all the time. And I realized, whoa, like it's a demar- Progression. Damn, Tom. Arcation line in the sand. Yesterday, at this time, I did not have the sense that I'm gonna become like Hugh Jackman, that I am a lifter. I am somebody who sticks through with what they say. And now today I'm just gonna decide that is me. And so I began telling people it, which gave all this pressure that yes. I had to live up to it. And I began to realize like, whoa, this is a lever that you can pull and it drives behavior. That's amazing. I mean, that pretty much explains the whole thing about identity. Right, so uh, I think the first identity we have is whatever identity we're trying to get attention for. I mean, you know, when, when you come out, you're saying your your family extremely obese. I think you said. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Was it a uh, mom and dad stayed together? Was it a healthy family? Was it loving? Was it was it a crazy environment? Was it a lot of pressure? No, like it was pretty good. He's but asking this guy up... question. Now. Damn, Patrick, you fucking ruining this shit for me. So I I have this recurring nightmare as a kid, and I can't explain it. I'm in a loveless marriage. So imagine me at 14. I've never had a relationship, but I, I have this recurring nightmare about being in a loveless marriage. Not realizing, of course, my parents were in a loveless marriage mm. and I just didn't know. Wow. And so on some subconscious level, I was obviously picking up on that. Mad respect to- All right, man, I'm gonna be honest. Okay, so right now, outcome's already done, direct, it's already done. He's got four points at systematic, four points at TEFI, uh, three points at SENI, uh, initiating's already closed, pragmatic for a couple and abstract for a couple. So it's looking like Patrick Davis is an ENTJ, but let's get um, some more points here. If he was fucking my parents who stayed together until three weeks was, after I left for college. He's on impact and theory and he's asking no, this question. No, and I actually respect it like that. I would never do that. I would never repay that because that's so crazy to me to live a life that's less than it could be for your kids, Just which for is why you. I don't have children. That makes sense. Um, so, but that, they did that. I'm very grateful. Wow going back to the identity part uh you know you had a moment that you had to make a decision and you asked some questions and you met a couple people you, that eventually you 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 that's se you know it's more on the se range but that's inspired SE. you to want to make change and then you went after what you wanted to do and that day when you said i'm going to start looking like you jackman the next day and one day the decision not that serious the next day here's who i'm going to end up being when i listen to your story it's all why to and uh, we don't spend enough time with Y2. Y2 is linked to identity. How to is systems learning. How to is systems learning. You see, he's systematic. He's systematic. And how to is more, uh, I mean, the Y2 is more TI. It's a skill. It's a skill set. Anybody can pick that up. So identity is you asking the questions until eventually you get to a point that you 
get to the deeper part of who do you want to be? What life do you want to live? And why do you want to live this life? Why is it important to you? Why is it what you're putting through okay, all Okay, so it looks like more of FI. He's trying to figure out why does he want to do it deep down? You know, what's really anchoring himself? Uh, what's pulling him to call of action? You know, like I said in the uh, interview the other day, um, I had a dream and uh, my dream let me know that um, a lot of the decisions I make even though I believe they're not FI decisions, they actually are FI decisions um, because I wouldn't be able to accomplish the things that I have accomplished um, if I didn't attach FI to those things. But when you're TE Dom, you tend to think you don't use FI, but you do. It's hours. Why would you want to do that? That transition when you go through it and then the pressure part when you said, here's who I'm going to be, where you declare your intentions to the world. This is what I'm going to be doing. A lot of times we keep things to secret. And so there's a debate. Some say you should never declare your intentions to the world because that pressure could create anxiety. You should never do it. You know, like Babe Ruth pointed a finger and I'm going to hit a home run. What if you don't hit it? What if you fail? You know, what if you say... What if you, what if you, what if, what if, what if, abstract? Okay, we're done here. Um, he's S-I-N-E. That's close on that. Um, and T-E-F-I dropping Babe Ruth's name. What if you do this? What if you do that? He's going to what if state. Michael Jordan says... The Bulls never winning, losing so, games. Are you talking about Michael Jordan as team? Seven. You should never say that because there's too much pressure on the players. Or then the other side said, well, you should put the pressure on yourself because your teammates play better because it's not on them. It's on you. And the leader does that. To me, um, I think declaring intention serves a purpose. I think when you go out there and you say, this is what I'm going to be doing. This is where I'm going to be at. You officially have the world holding you accountable. And I. Okay. That pressure could be good pressure to put into your life. Uh, we, we, we hear the phrase peer pressure, and we always get the negative connotation with peer pressure. Right? It's like, hey, uh, don't do drugs because of peer pressure. You know, Say no to drugs, peer pressure. Go to school, peer pressure, peer pressure. Where, I mean, it all depends who the peer is that's giving you pressure. Because if you got the right peer giving you the right kind of pressure, you can do some big things in your life. So You can I, do some big things in your life. I'll come again. Okay, but we're done here. Um, Patrick Davis at ENTJ. Um, what we noticed very early on is that um, Patrick uh, Bet David is direct. That means in his language, he's specific, concise, and to the point. Um, he's directing things um, in a flow type area. He's outcome, so that means he's magically he he looks at the end product um, to a point to like you know a lot of ENTJs can romanticize it. Um, he's a TEFI user. Um, so he cares about um, quoting other people. He quit, cares about outside sources. And he talks about outside sources. He's not saying, oh, this is my thinking. Or he's not saying this made logical sense to me. As you seen yesterday when we uh, did the breakdown of C.S. Joseph. Uh, C.S. Joseph, even if someone says something T.E., he don't just take it. It has to make logical sense to him before he accepts it. That's T.I. He's running through T.I. Um, as in a T.E. users, a lot of times can be very kind of just take information. They can just take information. Um, and not verified as much. Uh, so you can tell that he's TFI, he's S E N I. Um, he knows his path that he wants uh, for himself. Uh, he knows his future. Um, he's always talking about what other people are doing um, or what others are doing, what's in the environment um, from an SE perspective. Um, he's systematic. Obviously, this guy's always talking about formulas. Uh, do this formula, do that formula. Uh, the system here, um, I translated this from bodybuilding onto every business I've done. That's systematic, okay? He's initiated. He literally took over this man's show. He's on impact theory, and he's interviewing him. I don't even want to hear people say that this guy's introverted, okay? So, uh, and he's abstract. Like, he went through like a what if uh, moment where he just went crazy. What if this, what if that, what is that? Those are all what ifs. Um, what ifs are attached to abstract. So Patrick Beck David is an ENTJ and personality database actually got this correct. So yeah, um, let's go check the chart. Congratulations, uh, personality um, database. Uh, so he's an ENTJ and we said it earlier that ENTJs are direct, they're outcome, they're systematic, they're initiating, they're pragmatic, and they're abstract, okay? They're TFI users and they're SENI, it's all there. But it was a pleasure to do Patrick Beck David, but this is Mongolian Mindset and we're out.